So amendments and terminations, there's a lot of them, a lot of amendments that will need to happen. We hope we never have terminations, but we will. So we want to make sure, can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure we go through all the different categories. So let's first start with terminations. There's a whole class or two or three on how to not get your clients to terminate uh, or how to not get a deal to terminate. Um, and we're not gonna go over that. <laughs> we're just gonna go over the actual forms of how to terminate. Um, but it, it will happen. It, sometimes it's necessary to happen. Sometimes it was avoidable, but uh, you will have to, to turn in your termination paperwork. So does anybody know in residential real estate, North Carolina, how many forms we have to terminate a standard residential offer to purchase? How many forms do we have? Is it one, two, could be three, and it is four, okay? <laughs> so it's four. Four different terminations, okay? I'm gonna give you my opinion on a couple of things, and then, um, uh, I'll give you the, kind of what the real estate commission says on them, but I'm going to go in here into templates and we're going to pull up our termination forms. that I typically want you to use in a termination is this form 720. This is your terminate. Aaron, sorry. No, it's termination of agency. Uh, we're not looking for termination of agency. We're looking for termination of a 2T contract. The termination of contracts by mutual agreement and release of earnest money deposit is the form you typically want to use. So 720 is what you use for agency termination. 390 is what you're going to use for your contract termination. Okay? So I typically want you to use this form because I think it's nicer. It's a kinder way to say no thank you. And what I mean is because it's by mutual agreement. So both buyer and seller are agreeing that yeah, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna end this thing. It's for everybody's best interest that we end this contract. And we're also gonna agree to release the earnest money. Well, that's a much nicer situation, okay? Because you have termination of contract by mutual agreement with release of earnest money. We also have termination of contract by mutual agreement without the release of earnest money. And then the third form is uh, notice to buyer that sellers unilaterally exercising their right to terminate. And there's notice to uh, seller that buyers unilaterally gonna exercise their right to terminate. All of those are very aggressive or not very nice. There's a time to use them and we'll talk about that. But this is the form I typically would like us to be using when things are moving along and we just all decide, eh, we just aren't gonna, it's not gonna work. Had a situation come up yesterday, uh, buyer on a listing of ours, uh, lost her job. Oopsie daisy. Not good for anybody, buyer, seller, nobody, but hey, we gotta terminate, we gotta move on. We're signing this form, everybody agrees, yeah, we gotta move on, right? Release of earnest money, life happens, move on. So this is typically what I want you to, uh, to use. Now what do we fill out on here? We've got seller name, exactly the way it is on 2T. By your name, exactly the way it is on 2T. The mailing address is not a huge fan of, I'm just not a fan of filling out addresses for clients. But this is the one case when, by mutual agreement, everyone's kind of understanding that if the buyer's getting their earnest money back, maybe we can go ahead and fill in the, the buyer's mailing address. I think that's okay. Because we're already agreeing to move on. Not as big of a deal. That's why it's there, so they can return it. Contract, uh, what's the, you know, one, two, three Main Street, 
Waynesville, North Carolina, whatever. They just write the address in there. And the effective date of the contract is what? The date, the last time someone signed it. So let's say it was September 30th. You know, so we put in there September 30th, 2019. Whatever the effective date is of that contract. Whenever that was ratified. Okay. And then the deposit. The parties agree that the deposit shall be dispersed by the escrow agent in the following manner. And let's say there's a thousand dollar earnest money deposit. You say thousand dollars to be returned to the buyer. Okay. It could be thousand dollars to, to be returned to the seller. It could be five hundred dollars returned to the buyer, five hundred dollars to the seller. It could be one dollar to the buyer, nine hundred ninety nine to the seller. Right. Totally negotiable, whatever buyer and seller had agreed to have that money returned. And can you specify a manner of which, like, certified check, personal check? You can, you could, if you want to. I mean, typically the escrow money is going to be held by the attorney. Gotcha. So they're going to do what they want to do. <laughs> which is typically a check. Uh, but if they need it wired to them, most attorneys will do that for them, but they're going to charge them a fee to do that. All right, and then down here, if any other amount or other consideration is to be paid in connection with the termination of the contract, such amount of consideration is as follows. So whatever else is happening. Examples could be seller is to repay buyer's appraisal fee. Seller is paying $450 to buyer to repay their appraisal fee because you know, the buyer is terminating because of some issues that they think the seller should have known and whatever. So if there's any other monies going back and forth, that should be put here. All right. Okay, but before you go too far, on the effective date, that yep. was you said the last time date the contract was signed. Mm -hmm. If it was amended, does it the last day it was amended and initialed, or just the last day it was signed? Amended as far as like something added later, or like you know anything that changed in the during like negotiations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the. The date that the contract became ratified. So okay. it's a good it's a good Not question. Amendments. So like if yeah, if, if we were negotiating and then we said, okay, let's add the refrigerator in there, and then that was initial, great. Yes, it would be that date. Would but be. then a week later we decided, oh, we're also gonna add a washer and dryer, I would use that first date. Okay. 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 So the first time, the first time it became a contract. Okay. If we wanted to change it later, that's fine, but the first time it became a contract. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Is there anything in here that says how long they have to return the money? Or is that just up no. to the attorney as to what Yeah, that, that's governed by the laws on, on the escrow account and how long they have to re get that back to them. Um, so no, it's not really prescribed in here, um, but it, it should be as soon as possible. All right, so that's termination of contract and release of earnest money. Now we also have um, termination of contract without release of earnest money. Why would we sign this one? Sellers walk, or buyers walking away after due diligence. Buyers walking away after due diligence, but they want their earnest money back. And they're not getting it back. And the seller's like, you're not getting it back. And the buyer's like, yes, I am. And the seller's like, no, I'm not. You know? So we're we're going into kindergarten. It's not what mutual I agreement, that's right. It's a, yeah, so, but, but why are we both agreeing to terminate then? Uh, because that for some logistical reason, it can be continued, but the seller feels like the buyer still needs to have paid that money. It's the buyer's fault. The seller can't go back on the market until that contract is terminated, correct? Uh, Without calling it at least under contract show. So it's in the seller's best interest to terminate, even if they don't think the buyer should terminate or should be able to terminate. It's usually still either. in their best interest to go ahead and terminate and just keep the earnest money, right? But the buyer's not willing to release the earnest money, so we have a disagreement. Um, so this is a form that allows us to at least take one step forward 
terminate the contract, the seller can go back on the market, the buyer can go look for another property, neither one is tied to each other anymore, there's still this issue of earnest money that needs to get figured out. So this forms the same and yet different. It's the same as the other one where you got the same buyer, seller, it's contract effective date, and we sign it, buyer and seller sign, but there's another page because we haven't released the earnest money. So we sign the first page that terminates the contract, and then we have the second page, which is the release of the earnest money deposit, which could be signed at a later date. All right. So we terminate the contract, earnest money is still sitting with the attorney. How long do buyer and seller have to figure it out? Is it 90 days? Mm -hmm. What's the incentive for the buyers to sign that? To sign this? Mm -hmm. As opposed to say, no, I'm not signing it, I want to do the 390. Okay, let's say I'm the buyer's agent and the buyer's terminated after due diligence period for reasons of basically just, they don't feel like buying the house anymore or, or they found something wrong with the house and they don't want to like, it doesn't matter. So I'm advising my buyer client per the contract, it doesn't look like you should be able to get your earnest money back. Oh. I'm not saying you can get it back or you can't, because I'm not an attorney, mm -hmm. but I'm saying per the contract, what the way I read it, after due diligence date, you're not allowed to get your earnest money back. Mm -hmm. The buyer's like, I don't care, I want it back which is what they're gonna say most of the time. So well, we can ask for it. So we've now asked for it and the seller's like, nope, you're not getting it back. And so we're into this kindergarten game. And so why would the buyer sign this? Well, maybe they finally go consult an attorney and the attorney says, if you take this to court, you're gonna lose and you're gonna get sued for three times damages. And the buyer's like, fine, I'll sign it. <laughs> you know? So that's what usually happens. And so then okay. they, they're in a little, you know, ego match okay. for a few days. And then usually one side, the side that's wrong, goes and finally consults an attorney and the attorney advises them, yeah, you better sign that because we're gonna lose this in court. Okay. That's how that typically would happen. Okay. That's why they would sign it. Now again, we can never tell them you will get your earnest money back or you won't get it back. We can't tell them that. I like using the words per the contract. This is the way, this is what it says. But if you want further advice on that, you gotta consult an attorney. Okay. But let's say they don't agree. They're hard headed. They don't see it. So you consult an attorney, and the attorney says, I don't think you should take this in the court. Or maybe the attorney says, Well, you might have a case here. So what, how does that happen? What has to happen? The person holding the escrow account has to do what? They have to advise both parties that you've got 30 days to figure this out. If they don't figure it out, they give it to the clerk of court in the county in which the property is located. Okay, so they give it to that clerk of court. And the clerk of court is gonna then file a hearing, typically with a magistrate, and both sides are gonna have the opportunity to show up, make their case, and the magistrate will decide where the money goes. If nobody shows, then it goes into the S cheat fund of the state of North Carolina and gets used for scholarship money. Typically, whatever officials choose to do with that money. Um, so once that happens, then they can't get it back. They can't get it back. Yeah. If they don't show up. Yes. And that's what typically happens. Typically one side shows and the other side doesn't. And even if the one side that shows does not have a good case, they will get the money. Yeah. I mean, it's up to the magistrate, but typically the magistrate's like, yeah, you showed, you're, that's what they do. That's what I've seen them do. Um, but if, if they both people show up, then you simply, in my, I've, I've been there for some of those, and you typically bring in your, your, your offer to purchase, you bring whatever else, or whatever case you want to present, you can have an attorney with you. You don't have to have an attorney with you. And they, they'll look at your documents and typically it's no more than five, 10 minutes max. And the magistrate will make a, make a judgment and say, all right, you get the money, you get the money or split it or whatever. Okay. And that's something you do as an agent with your client. Come talk to me. Oh. Depends. Uh, no, I really don't. How do you mean supportive? I don't. 
Well, it depends. It depends what we need to do, but uh, we're going to be very careful about that because we're not attorneys. So sure. We can't sure, right. do anything but present the facts. If, if they want us there, they just, here's the contract. Yes, sir, this is what happened. Then that's fine. But, okay, so that's typically how it happens. But do most they, of the time, it won't end up that way because people will get in that ego match for a little while and then end up signing the second page. Do they pay for that? Court fees and stuff yes, there work? will be court fees. Okay. Yeah, your taxes somehow don't pay enough to have services provided. I'll leave that to myself. <laughs> he says, not doing so. <laughs> I don't know why I record these things. <laughs> All right. So those are those are the the two that we typically want, right? Um, and then there's two other ones. We've got the notices. Unilateral notices. So this first one, notice to seller. Notice. Myself as the buyer, I'm exercising my right to unilaterally terminate the offer to purchase and contract. So you don't get a choice, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. I'm terminating it. Okay. So why can a buyer do that? Well, there are no fill in the blank forms here. It is just a check mark. It has to be one of these issues. There are one non receipt of a copy of the North Carolina Residential Property Disclosure Statement. Oh, snap. So if that seller of yours is getting squirrely about getting that property disclosure back to you, first of all, you shouldn't have been on the market yet. But let's say you are, you got a contract, you need to tell them by not giving them the property disclosure statement that buyer has a right to terminate and get their due diligence money back too, by the way, okay? Um, so number two, exercise by buyer of right to terminate during the due diligence period. That's the most common one used, okay? I'm in my due diligence period, the way the contract says, buyer can terminate for any reason. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I don't feel like it anymore. It's fine. Check mark number three, the property is not in sub substantially the same or better condition at closing as the date of this offer. Reasonable wear and tear accepted. Gets into your property burning down. You come to the walkthrough, there's flames coming up through the house, not the same house anymore, right? So that would be a situation where buyer could unilaterally terminate the contract okay that's the extreme example but what would be some less extreme? like the house is still there but what would be um when, when we went to the property and we showed it and when we did inspections the hvac units were perfectly working and now it's january it's 20 degrees out and we walk in to do the walkthrough and they're not working and we freak out and we try to figure it out and it turns out the hvac units are completely busted not substantially the same condition. So that kind of situation could happen. It could be something, I mean, substantial is the legal key term there, but it could be something as easy as when the sellers move, they, they pull these bookshelves off the wall and there's all kinds of mold or something on that wall and they pull the rugs up and there's termite damage in the rugs that were hidden before, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Big deal things. It needs to be big. It can't be a scrape on the wall or something. Yes. But that's up for an attorney to debate. Right? Mm -hmm. um, sellers delay in closing and settlement and closing beyond the time period, uh, time permitted under the terms of the contract. So we like to say 14 days. That's kind of the guideline we've been given. Uh, but that's not a hard and fast rule. It's just kind of a bar association says eh, 14 days ish. So it could be 15, 16, could be 10, 11. Just kind of depends okay but roughly the, the seller is delaying closing exercise by a buyer of right to terminate under paragraph 10 a backup contract addendum um, so something has happened and uh, they now want to terminate because they want to buy a different house and they're under backup contract on this house does that make sense exercise by buyer of right to terminate under paragraph 4 of the short sale addendum it basically says seller has certain amounts of time to figure this stuff out and the buyer can back out at any time during that period. 
Okay. Which one is the one for um, a contingency if they had to sell their house before they bought a new one? Uh, it no longer exists. Oh. If with the new contract in 2019, the contingency sale addendum is no longer exist. It's built into the contract, but it's no longer in here. So if, if their home didn't sell, then it, they'd want to terminate it. It would need to be covered under the due diligence period. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Exercise by buyer of right to terminate as provided in the FHA VA financing addendum basically, basically says the house needs to be able to appraise for the purchase price. So you have a little extra something there. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I typically don't want you to use this if you don't have to, but there is several good reasons to have to use it. I think if the house burns down, you know, I would use this form. I'm not gonna care if you mutually agree or not at that point. Um, but the biggest one is due diligence period, right? So I think, let's say our due diligence period ends October 31st. And today we discover something with the house that tells my buyer, no, we don't wanna buy this house anymore. You can easily fill this form out. That's fine, I'm not gonna say anything about it, that's great. Fill the form out, that's legal, it's correct. You're saying during, during due diligence. During due diligence. But I would also say, why not just fill out the mutual agreement one? It's, to me, it's a little cl more clear. We're gonna release the earnest money, everything's mutually agreed to. Just a little bit personal preference. Mm -hmm. But there is a time when you must use this form. And that is, let's say, uh, due diligence ends today at five o'clock. Due diligence ends October 3rd at five o'clock. We're in whatever negotiations with the seller, and for whatever reason I can't get them on the phone, we're not sure if the negotiations are gonna work or not in time, because come five o'clock, that earnest money's non-refundable. So to protect my buyer, I need my buyer signing this form that's unilateral, does not need to be signed by the other side with that check mark saying um, for a due diligence period. I need to, in, and I could have it signed by my buyer and just have it in waiting and come 445, we don't have the answers we need from the seller yet, send. Anybody ever come back on that with the time being there? Like, let's say you just advised your buyer to do that and it was one o'clock in the afternoon. And just in case the seller doesn't get back to us by five, we want to have this ready. But what if the seller does get back to you at 445 and you then send this form that's time stamped at one o'clock? Could they argue with that at all? No, because when you deliver it to them. Okay. Now, again, I wouldn't have my buyer sign this without explicit texting or emailing right. with my buyer saying, okay, I don't, Aaron, I don't want you to send this to them until 445 mm -hmm. if we haven't heard what we need to hear yet. Gotcha. Okay. But that way I have it signed. I'm ready to go. I don't want them trying to sign this at 445 because that, <laughs> that could end up being a problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make sense? So don't screw around with the mutual agreement stuff on time is of the essence issues when you're the day of or the day before, you need to send, now you need to send the notice to seller. And because this doesn't have anything about the funds that- It, it does oh, on okay. page two. Oh, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. So page one, again, will just automatically terminate unilaterally. Mm -hmm. And then you have page two for the earnest money. So the seller still needs to sign this um, to release the earnest money. And notice, there is no negotiation here. There is no, hey, buyer needs to sign, like, no, this seller just is agreeing that all the money goes to the buyer. Okay. Is that because those are the only like legitimate reasons for the buyer to unilaterally terminate mm -hmm. the contract and get their money back? Yep. Okay. So sellers then agreeing, what, what this is saying is the buyer, the seller doesn't have a choice. Now, can an attorney argue that? Sure, but that's for the attorneys to worry about. If the seller's like, you don't have a right to unilaterally terminate, I don't agree with what you're putting here. Talk to one another <laughs> here, you know? But that's not that's not for us to argue yeah. as a realtor. Okay, questions on that form? All right, same thing on the notice to buyer. Okay. 
Notice the buyer that's seller exercising their unilateral right. Everything's still the same, but we only have four blocks here. Buyer's failure to timely deliver the due diligence fee or earnest money deposit. So they don't get the earnest money in, they don't get due diligence money in, seller can unilaterally terminate. Buyer's failure to timely deliver additional earnest money deposit. Okay, if you have that additional stuff coming in, then there's a time stamp to that. And if they don't do that, then the seller could terminate. Number three, buyer's delay in settlement at closing. All right, so if they're, they're not closing on time, again, there's sort of this 14 day window in there-ish, but it's not hard and fast rule. But if the, the buyer is delaying and we're, we're, we've gone past that, and the seller's like, I, I just wanna terminate, they, they would have that unilateral right. And then the short sale addendum, seller wants to terminate for that. Okay, same thing, seller signs, and then the earnest money, okay? And this one's a little different, saying the seller agrees or does not agree on where the earnest money should go. Okay, questions on that one? So how many forms do we have to terminate? Four. Four. Right? What's the one we typically want to use? 319. Yep. By mutual agreement, right? Okay. Now let's go back to 720, your termination of agency agreement. Mm, we don't like this one. But it'll happen. Sometimes it's our brand. <laughs> um, so same thing here. We're terminating our agency agreement. So we have the client, client's name, and then the firm, Weikert Realtors Unlimited. An agency agreement here, exclusive right to sell listing agreements, vacant land, uh, buyer agency agreements. What is it? What are we terminating here? So you would select, say it's a listing, we do that. We type in there 123 Main Street, um, you know, whatever, Asheville, North Carolina, 28803. I might even put in MLS number, whatever. Okay. So that's what we're terminating. The agreement was dated on September 1st and was set to expire January 31st, whatever it was. Then client signs, you can sign for the firm and that would terminate it. The only box here is the expense reimbursement. Typically that's gonna be zero, depends on what's going on. In this scenario here, we signed in September, it was supposed to go through end of January and they terminated here in October. Why? I wanna know why. Well, there, there could be good reasons. We had a couple of really good reasons come up recently, you know, cancer comes up, something comes up, it's like, oh, we need to stay where we are. Understand, no worries, you know. But sometimes uh, we've also had it come up where the seller just, I don't know, this isn't gonna abide by the contract they have with the firm. And we've put in five, six, seven hundred dollars in marketing, maybe more, uh, and now they wanna terminate early. But it'd be reasonable for us to say, well, look, we thought we had until January for the contract, we invested time and money to try to help you get your house sold. I would like some reimbursement on that marketing fund since I'm willing to abide by my contract, but you're breaking the contract. So I've got asked for some funds. If you're gonna do that, please come talk to me first so I can be prepared for those phone calls. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes there's a legit reason that we, we should ask because uh, they're breaching the contract and we're putting forth our time and money and then they didn't abide by it. So that's, that's something that we will ask for from time to time if necessary. Um, and sometimes people will, will pay it reasonably and they're, they're good reasonable people and sometimes they won't. Uh, we'll deal with that. Would you advise keeping track of all of your expenses like per listing? I would advise it. Do I practice that? <laughs> so is it usually I mean, in like QuickBooks an and stuff, it's always going to be in there. Yeah. So I guess I could always get it, but I can't say I, I really do that myself. But uh, it's a really good idea. Yeah. But you need to get that signed when you're going to withdraw a property permanently from the market, which by the way, if you have to withdraw a property, you can't do that as an agent. I have to do that as the manager. 
So you get one of those signs, you gotta call me, come talk to me, and I'll, I'll have to be the one to withdraw it. Okay? Same thing with a buyer agency agreement though. You have, you have to terminate them. There's, I bet there's a million buyer agency agreements out there in our country right now where people are not talking to each other anymore. The agent's not really working with the person anymore, but they haven't officially terminated that agreement. It's a bad scenario for both sides. So if we're gonna agree not to work together anymore, let's terminate the agreement, okay? All right, enough of the termination talk. How about just an amendment? Can we back off a little bit and just amend it? <laughs> um, so let's talk about a couple of amendments. Um, let's look at before we look at 4T, let's look at the agency amendment. Just our agency renewal and amendment. Okay, so this is to amend our listing agreements or buyer agency agreements. To extend them, to change anything else we wanna change with them. You notice all this big blank white area here. It's okay for you to write in that because this is an agreement between the firm and the client. So it's not between buyer and seller, it's between the firm and the client. So yes, you can go ahead and write in something different in here if you need to, okay? So let's say we're gonna change a listing agreement. We check off which form it is. The dated part, it's not today's date, is the date that the listing agreement was signed. Okay, so let's say that was September 1st. Between the client, Joe Schmo, Weikert Realtors Unlimited. Property address, 123 Main Street, MLS number 1234567, okay? And then, it's renewed or extended. Are we gonna extend the listing agreement? Let's say it ends here October 15th and everybody decided let's move it towards the end of the year. So we could do that. Price changed from 399.9 to 205.9. Okay. Wow. Big change. Big change. <laughs> okay. So but you don't, so, okay. Okay. Anytime you change price, you have to have this form signed before we change it on the multiple listing service. It's another big issue out there. I, I shudder to know how many price changes have been made today alone in our MLS without this form actually being signed. Is that 710? Is that the number? 101. Uh, 710. The form is 710. Oh. Form 710. But please, please, please don't call me and text me. Well, you can call and text, I'll just tell you no. But don't call me and text me and say, hey, they emailed me that they're okay changing the price from 200 to, one, to 185. Can I just change it and have them sign it later? No. Okay? Now, I would agree, you know, in Aaron world, that works fine. I got something saying they want to do that, that's fine. But legally, no, we have an agreement, a listing agreement with them saying we're gonna advertise it at a certain price. So no, they have to, they have to sign this. Well, they're, they're on a cruise ship and they, they don't think they can get, you know, they, they don't think they can electronically sign. Well, they texted you, right? So figure it out. Or, hey, we gotta wait till they get back. I mean, so don't make excuses for it. You gotta get them to sign it, okay? We should never ever change that price without having to sign first. Other amendments, what else might we change? I don't know, maybe they want us to now advertise the refrigerator. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they want us to now only sell for the same price and always want us to sell the one house with the lot and not the extra lot next door. Whatever other changes could be made, okay? Typically that should be blank, but if you have other things there, you can go ahead and write them in. And then you sign and they sign, pretty simple. Just 
the big point I want to make on this form is please, please, please get it signed when you make price changes. Hopefully Allison and Beth are catching those. I know they've got some, um, but we need to have those inputted into Weikert Works when you get them signed uh, and we have that price change. Do you care who signs first, whether they sign or we sign? All right, amendments to change the contract. That is 40. This is the form you typically want to use if you need to make changes to your 2T between buyer and seller. You'll notice there is no big blank white space on this one. This one you can't just go willy nilly on, you only have a few options. All right, it's pretty simple to fill out. You've got your buyer, you've got your seller, exactly how they were written on QT. You've got the property address here, and then we can change purchase price. Going from 285 to 275. We're gonna add additional earnest money. Why would we add additional earnest money later? You're gonna ask them? <laughs> They're asking to extend the due diligence period. We're asking to, send, to extend the due diligence period. So we're gonna change the due diligence period here. Um, say it was gonna be October 3rd, and now we want it to be October 31st. And the seller says, I'll agree to that, but the additional earnest money is hereby changed from zero to $35,000. <laughs> we want 35K if you're gonna extend that, okay? Now just to sidestep a minute, let's talk about that negotiation. What did we just do there? I know this is completely separate from the number. But if, if I extended my due diligence to the end of October, but I asked the buyer to put up $35,000 more earnest money, what did I really accomplish? Nothing. Nada. Really nothing, right? Because the buyer can still back out. You know, there's still, there's still something to it, right? Because if they're willing to put up 35 grand, put it somewhere else other than their bank account, it still tells me as a seller, they're still pretty serious. But I would like to do that as a buyer, okay? I'm not saying you, we always recommend our clients put up 35 grand, but I would let them know they could. It's an option. I'll tell you right now, I bought properties this way. I'll tell the seller, hey, I need, I need a week for for this inspection or two weeks for that inspection, I'll put up an extra big bunch of money for additional earnest money. You know, my, my, my due diligence date is down here and people are just like, oh yeah, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Schmucks. I mean, it's, it's, it's monopoly money, right? That's how I bought this building. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. The bank was like, we insist that you have more earnest money as we go down the road. And I forget the exact dates, but it was something like we need, you know, January 15th, we need like $50,000 more earnest money. And in December 15th, we need $10,000 more earnest money. I said, sure, no problem. We closed like December 7th. None of it ever came up. And for whatever reason, this banker guy was all, that was his big thing. And I was like, sure, no problem. The other agent was like, dude, are you serious? Like, that's not gonna be a problem? I'm like, no, it's not gonna be a problem. I'm thinking I'm gonna close before that anyway. Moron, you know? Well, how could that so, happen? So, so it's how, negotiation. How do they know that you, they're going to close December 7th? Because they're not listening to me. Oh. That's, I mean, in that scenario, that was what was happening. That banker in Texas just isn't listening. But my, my point is, I, I negotiated to where I actually think I got a better price because I was willing to do all those things they're asking for, right? And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't care. That's all money I'm putting into the deal anyway. I don't really care, you know? So sometimes it's a good negotiation ploy. Additional earnest money can be like monopoly money, but I'm much, much more comfortable doing that with my money than someone else's. Mm -hmm. But I would still let them know if people are gonna ask, hey, what's another way we can negotiate this? I'm gonna bring that up. Here's a way, you know. Uh, so again, if we're gonna do that, then additional earnest money deposit date might change as well. So that's here. The building deposit, you got a new 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 build going up. Maybe you want to. Uh, the builder now wants more money down because you made some changes or something. That's how you would change that. Due diligence fee. 
And that might be another reason for due diligence period, right? To Kenna's point, he might do this, and this was kind of benefit the buyer, right? Sure, I'll put up more money that I can back out on at any time. Or a smart seller might be like, yeah, 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 put that up due diligence fee, yeah. right? Yeah, you can get more time. Give me a thousand dollars more. That'd be maybe a smarter idea for the seller. That's right? what I did. That's what you did. There you go. Right, and that might be very reasonable depending on the situation, right? Yeah, because they're asking you to keep it off the market longer. Mm -hmm. So you can change all that. You can change the escrow agent. Another issue I see come up sometimes, you cannot put into the contract Joel Weaver Law Firm and then just willy-nilly decide, well, we're gonna change it to fill a price. You can't do that. That's a term of the contract between buyer and seller. So you can do it, but it's gotta come in here and both buyer and seller have to sign this. Okay, so that's how you change that. Settlement date, hereby change to whatever. Notice the block underneath it, this is important. Check only, only if the, the following applies, notwithstanding anything to the contrary in the delay of settlement closing, uh, if a delaying party fails to complete settlement and closing within four days, following the settlement date above, the delaying party shall be in breach and the non-delaying party may terminate the contract in accordance with the delay and settlement closing paragraph. So it's adding an extra layer of legalism there so that we don't just keep these 14 day periods rolling and rolling. So a, a seller might say, yeah, fine, I'll give you until just, you know, I don't know, October 15th, but I'm gonna check this off. So really you've got until October 19th or we gone. Not October 19th. Not October 29th. Okay, so that's that's also in here. Your expenses, your closing costs. Excuse, so yep. uh, you wouldn't check that if they wanted to go for another 14 days, right? right. Check only if you're limiting it to the 14 days. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. and Make that, sure your clients know that. Yeah. And that settlement date, like when we did when we filled out the 2T, I think we just picked a date. Like well, hopefully we're not. <laughs> hopefully we're not grabbing into a hat and picking a date. We're talking to the lender, talking with the listing okay. side, seeing, when seeing what makes sense for everybody. But, but if the lender all of a sudden says, "Oh, geez, I've got the flu, I can't meet until Monday, and there's nobody to go in my place," like then you can fill one of these out, like no problems. You can fill it out, no problem. But everybody's got to sign. Yeah. It. <laughs> so everybody's got to agree to it. Yeah. 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 All right, closing costs, you can change that. That'll often happen during um, due diligence period and we're gonna negotiate repairs and instead of asking for some repairs, we're gonna go ahead and you know add more closing costs. So go from 2,000 to 4,500 in closing costs. And back up one second. So that um, changing that settlement date, you were saying you, you have to, in, while you're changing that date, you gotta go ahead and call the attorneys, call everybody, make sure that date's okay with them. Sure, yeah. Yep. Now, most of the time, the attorneys understand that extensions are just part of life and they kind of plan on that. So any of the good attorneys I know will understand and say, all right, we can't close now, but we can close in two days. The attorneys just got to fit it in their schedule and they know that. If for some reason they can't, it could be a problem in me giving them future business. But they, they've got to know, though, that this got changed. They got, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And then they tell you what yes. time. And the lender there. needs a copy of this. The attorney needs a copy of this. This becomes part of the contract. Okay. Yes, good point. Very important that you let them know. <laughs> yes, okay. that's a good point. Yes, because sometimes that, that can creep up on you. And we forget to send them that form. And then they're like, hey, is anybody coming to closing? They're like, oh. You can have it. Do you want to make sure? That's make sure. We're doing it. Yeah. Well, I've never done that. A few times. All right. So that's your agreement to amend contracts. Um, now wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Isn't there something else in the contract that we might want to change? That's not on that form. Sure. There's a lot of other terms that aren't on that form, right? So how would we make those changes? If we need to amend the, 
2t, mm -hmm. how would we do that if it's not one of those issues? Miscellaneous. <laughs> there is no miscellaneous on that form. That's a different form. Different form. We had due diligence period. We had settlement date. Um, we did not have personal property on that. Mm -hmm. So if something else happens that's not covered by 4T, then you, you simply have to go back to 2T and make the changes. But this gets back to what we were talking about with dot loop. You don't want to make changes and erase everyone's signatures because it's still a valid contract from before. You, so you go in, you save it as a PDF file, and then you would come in here and let's say, obviously we're not going to change language, but let's just say this said refrigerator. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come in here, add a strike through, change that okay whatever so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna add okay, it won't let me here mm -hmm. um, but once you save it as a PDF it'll let you add a text box and then add a text box and put refrigerator in there and then have everybody initial that okay so that's how you would change things in 2t so you're not really crossing off what you did you just did as an example you're crossing off Right. Okay. Yeah, please don't make changes to the contract. Right. Okay. So making double strokes. This isn't. <coughs> this has to do with the refrigerator, but not this form. But remember when people were swapping out refrigerators, you know, and leaving them. Do you uh, need to write in existing refrigerator on your author purchase? You don't have to now. Legally, it is implied that that refrigerator is the refrigerator. The, the, what you saw, just like we got to the, the same condition as when you looked at the yeah. property, that's implied into the contract. Could you do that to help clarify? Sure, but it's not necessary. Okay. If you didn't put that, you're not wrong. You know, some people go as far as putting the model number of the refrigerator and stuff. Great, uh, that's that's wonderful. If you want to do that, that that's extra help. That's what um, they advised, you don't, advised us to do in Control. Sure, that's extra help. It's it's great, but it's not necessary legally to. They can't make an argument. Well, you didn't say that refrigerator. Yeah, we did, because that was the one that was seen. Okay, okay, that's what I was. Mm -hmm. There was any backup to that? So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's implied into the contract. And it might be. Okay. All right. Um, let's um, I'm going to go over one other form that I'm thinking about. If you have any other forms you want to look at, let's do that. Um, but I want to look at 3T. It's kind of a fun form. Seems like we're using it more than we used to. How many T's are there? <laughs> Enough to get T me teed off. 3T? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's a flashcard type thing. Yeah, and, and I, it's just something in my brain. I don't remember the form numbers very well. So sometimes you'll call me like, hey, Aaron, on 710, this. Like, let me go back and look at it. Yeah. I remember the names more. And some people, like, they can rattle off the numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons I didn't become a cop was <laughs> my brother was like, <laughs> telling me all these numbers. Like, you got to know this and this and that. I'm like, yeah, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Give me a gun. Tell me to walk around. I'm all right. But yeah. don't tell me to abide by some sort of rule. <laughs> but no, but like those numbers, I don't, I don't remember well. So sometimes I know I know some of our agents get upset with me. They're like, well, Aaron, I mean that form. Like, what's the name of the form, please? So. That's just how different brains work different it's ways. Just, it's mm -hmm. just my brain. Yeah. So 3T is the additional signatures addendum. Pretty cool form. Pretty cool form. Mm -hmm. You can use this on almost any of the forms that we have. And the reason you would use it uh, would be when you have multiple people buying a property or selling the property. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in an estate issue, I've, se I've seen numbers in the 20s like, of people oh that need goodness. to sign. Wow. Ugh. Yeah, ugh, that's right. There's always one jack wagon in every family. It just makes it hard. So, but yeah, say you had six people that needed to sign. There's only two places on, on the contract for them to sign. Well, this is the additional signatures addendum. And so the way you would use this form is you'd say, this is for property address, 123 Main Street, Asheville, whatever. 
And then the additional signatures addendum is attached to and made part of the following name document, including any addendum listed here. Okay, so we could say it's part of, you don't want to say just 2T. Okay, you don't. You want to say 2T offer to purchase, purchase and contract, right? If I can spell, but whatever. Jeez, Aaron. Um, so I would say whatever that is, um, spelled correctly, hopefully. And then I come back in here and then say also it's going to apply to uh, the lead based paint addendum. Uh, the property disclosure statement, you know, is going to apply to uh, addenda A because they added an extra addenda to this contract, this, the buyer did, whatever it is. And you're going to put all of those forms. It could be listing agreement, uh, customer services disclosure, like every single form that needs to be signed. All you got to do is list them. Blah, 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 blah. Now, of course, with this, you need to send those forms. So they can look at them. I've seen that come up once where the, the client called me and was like, yeah, we'll sign this, but what are these forms? I'm like, our agent can send it to you? No. Okay. <laughs> Let me get you the forms. <laughs> so you need to actually send them the, the, the forms, right? And so they can look them over. But then the, everything on those forms, by them signing here, say I'm the, the buyer in this case, by them signing here, they're agreeing to everything on all of those forms. Oh, that's why people are using it more. Yeah. So it's it's super easy mm -hmm. instead of having you know twenty people or even six people sign every single place on a contract and disclosures and everything else. You can just mm -hmm. use this. Do you think that people are not that I would do this, but do you think that people are using this so that they don't have to send fifteen forms? You still need to send them the forms. No, but like get them to sign. Maybe somebody's like hard to track down and you're like, hey, here's all the forms. You review them. That's a good you think point. they're trying to like That'd be circle helpful. around. That would be a good reason to do that, yeah. That's a good, good point. Okay, so that's, that's one you can use if you get a bunch of people involved. Okay. So Aaron, in that case, you're sending that out with all the forms to all 20 people. Mm -hmm. They're all signing it electronically and sending it all back to you, and Dot Loop is then merging them. It would merge it all together, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's kind of the cool thing there. Mm -hmm. And of course, with Dot Loop, you'd be able to see who signed it and who hasn't. I mean, it seems like a nightmare to figure out, well, how many of these 20 have signed or not. In Dot Loop, you'd easily be able to see, hey, Joe and Sarah haven't signed yet, so I need to talk to them, make sure they, they get it signed. Well, that's where you need the email for each of the 20 people. Yes, you do. Can you send like reminders in there? Yeah, you can. If you see that somebody has it, you'd be like, hey, don't forget. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is the one we had you sign in or not. You can read, it's called reshare. Okay. You can reshare it to them and send a new email. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, any other forms y'all want to cover? You know, just any that we'll need. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's all right. Uh, let me take a quick perusal. And some of these we'll go over later. Okay. okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to go over real quick is completely separate from the forms, but having to do with off city. So I know I talked with Juliana, Melanie, Amy. No. Okay. Ken, are you on off city? Yeah. Loosely. Yeah. <laughs> I've been snoozing them. Active. No, I've been snoozing them. Yeah, that's fine. So We're I talked to you all about the same lady called me again today and she's like, Hey, you got any, anybody else? Cause like, I don't want to open this up to other companies if I don't have to. And I said, yeah, please tell Um, so the way she has it, Juliana is the only one that's actually filled it out. You guys get the email? Okay. What I'm trying to do is, uh, is to make it as simple as possible is have that email come as an app on my phone uh -huh. so I can answer it right away. Well, you, you will actually oh, have an app. app. You will load an app. An app city app? An app city app. Oh, okay. And then it, like, it has you allow notifications and so you just get like basically like a little 
or a text oh, message. Like okay. my phone's always on okay. silent, but I was the one I just. But it sounds like.